Thank you, Paolo. Time I have um, a line of research that I'm pursuing in the last uh, uh, couple of years, maybe three years, uh, which is um, about the, well, in which I'm focusing on uh, rough landscapes uh, as like an important element, an important uh, uh, perspective to understand how um, algorithms in inference problem works and how machine learning itself uh, work as like an inference problem itself. Um, and uh, in the title you see rough glassy landscape because the main perspective, the main approach I will use to study the glass, the rough landscape in the context of computer science will be this approach that has been developed along the years in the context of the study of glass physics. And while this leads us to this uh, first very broad introductory slide, that is like we want to give a broader perspective on the importance of uh, a rough landscape that are found to have application in completely different fields, starting from the problem of glass physics and spin glasses, which is like a traditional um, setting in which this study of uh, landscape, which are in this case uh, uh, free energy or energy landscapes, are studied in more detail to understand the, well, the mechanical properties of, this, uh, of these materials. But you see like application of the same perspective for uh, in biochemistry, um, for the study of proteins, uh, protein folding, but also more generally in biology for the study of evolution and ecology. And while more recently, it turns out that this perspective might be also very interesting to understand a number of aspects of performances of algorithms in uh, computer science. So, that's something that might be uh, of interest for you in a like, closer, um, more specific way. Uh, so again, what I do is to borrow the tools developed in the context of study of glasses to say something new and understand better what is the connection between landscape and dynamics uh, in the case of inference, in the case of machine learning, and also to uh, maybe develop strategies to improve algorithmic performances by knowing the structure of the landscape that is underlying the problem that we want to study. So this is the program. And well, to uh, start with this program, I want to introduce what is this um, like um, paradigmatic model that will constantly have in mind uh, while trying to explain uh, the um, dynamics, different dynamics in, uh, in, uh, in inference problem. And this, uh, this model is considered the fruit fly or the Ising model for a rough landscape. So the standard reference model. Uh, it is called the P-spin model and is uh, very simply defined by this expression. So this is the energy of the system and is uh, a function of the, all the degrees of freedom of the system, which are the spin variables. And well, this function is just the product of P of these uh, spin variables. And every product has a, a factor that is a random uh, variable, which is typically Gaussian distributed with zero mean and a certain variance. And the variance scales in such a way that the energy of the system will be extensive. So proportional to the number of degrees of freedom uh, at the end. All right? So that's the definition of the model. And well, it turns out that this, if you plot this function, if you would be able to plot this function as a function of all the degrees of freedom of the system, these uh, spin variables, you will get a very rough, complicated function such as this. And well, as a consequence of that, the static and the dynamic of this system is pretty new. So it has been studied, well, new, I, I'm talking about 30 years, let's say, uh, new. Uh, 30 year old, uh, but pretty recent. And while well, you have uh, a statistical mechanic approach that has been developed to study the thermodynamic properties of this system that use replicas to find the, the correct solution. And then there has been the development of a dynamic mean field theory that would be able to describe the non-trivial dynamics that take place uh, when you want to study like a physical, like the relaxation as a physical system would do, starting from a, via, a higher level of the energy. And this 
uh, relaxation would be, of course, described by uh, a Langevin dynamics. So here you have, sorry, here I forgot the derivative, um, derivative um, with respect to time is give, uh, given by this expression uh, as it is standard for Langevin dynamics um, prescription. And uh, well, if you, you start from this expression, you can develop this theory and understand how well, the dynamics proceed. Uh, and then, well, on top of this, there has been a lot of studies uh, about this uh, same um, problem, about, and specifically about the structure of the landscape by means of different tools, uh, by means of uh, supersymmetries, and uh, a tool that is borrowed from mathematics, which is called the katz rice formula, and that enabled uh, people to uh, have access to the statistics of stationary point that are present in this landscape and enable people to put this structure in connection with the feature of the dynamics. So putting all together this result, the picture that one should have in mind is the following. This landscape that before was represented in two dimensions now is even more schematically represented, but I'm adding uh, ad additional information. We know that there should be like a finite range of the energy in which this minima exist, so the stationary points are actually minima. Above that, uh, these this stationary points are typically saddles, and the minima that are at the top layer are much more frequent than the one at the lower la layer, and are characterized by uh, a stability that is typically different from the one that are underneath, because these are like are defined uh, as being marginally stable, meaning that they are kind of flat and some of the eigenvalue of the Hessian uh, is touching zero. Okay, actually the, the whole spectrum is touching zero. All right? So that's the picture about um, the minima. And what you also have, uh, start <laughs> obtaining, well, studying the dynamics is that if you start from a random initial configuration that is associated with the high value of the energy, these dynamics will slowly go down in this landscape dominated by stationary points that are not minima but are saddles, and then it will slowly approach this first layer of minima, which are called threshold uh, states. Okay, this first layer um, of minima. And it will never be able to go below that, below that unless you would expect the time that scales exponentially with the size of the system. So that's the picture. You see, we have a very clear representation of what is the dynamics, how is the dynamics performing, and how it is connected to the structure uh, of the landscape underneath. Questions up to here? Please. So the, the various different lines you plot here on the, on the axis, does that represent various configurations of that energy? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. So I'm compensating on this one-dimensional representation, what it is instead an n-dimensional representation. Yes. All right? Thank you. OK. So let's see how we'll, we'll be able to apply this to a problem of inference. So first of all, a very brief introduction that is mostly uh, devoted to set the terminology. So inference. We will be dealing with a problem that is a problem of extracting an information from a message that has been sent through a channel. Uh, we know its structure, but unfortunately, the channel is, uh, um, is um, disturbed. There is some noise, so we cannot get the full information when we, uh, when we receive the message. So we have to do some work afterwards to clean the, uh, the message and retrieve the original signal. So this is the observation we get, something that is blurred um, because corrupted by a certain amount of noise. And we want to retrieve, well, the signal as it was at the beginning. And we want to, well, set up in place like a meter to retrieve the signal. So we want to estimate, to produce a, what is our best estimate of the signal given the meter we want, uh, we, we set in place. Now, when we deal with such a problem, we define two different uh, threshold or uh, uh, transition in some cases. The first one is um, answer to the question of whether the information that we got uh, in 
terms of the observation is sufficient, at least in principle, to retrieve the signal. What does it mean, at least in principle? It means that, well, having uh, the possibility to do an exhaustive search of all the um, of all the, the space in which the signal could be present, we would be able to recognize, to obtain an estimate that has certain information of the signal. Uh, and it, so we, we can retrieve the signal, at least in principle, in this setting. So this is the information theoretic transition. And then instead, there is the algorithmic transition that instead focus on the computational efficiency of the meter that we are setting in place to retrieve the signal. So here it is the question of whether we are able to um, define and perform, well, define an algorithm that will be able to obtain an estimation of this signal that contains the information and this algorithm will be able to get there in a polynomial time. Well, polynomial is uh, in terms of the number of degrees of freedom uh, of our system, and that might be, for example, the number of pixels for an image. All right? That's just to set the terminology. And now we go to the specific problem uh, I had in mind and on which I uh, have been working on. And on at the end of this slide, you will see the straightaway connection with the model uh, that comes from the glass physics that I uh, introduced in the, in the previous slide. All right, so what is this problem? We have, we observe a tensor, okay? That's our observation. And we know that this tensor is the sum of a rank one tensor that is constructed from this outer product of the uh, signal that we want to retrieve, plus a corrupting noise, which is a Gaussian noise with zero mean and a certain variance. So the task would be to, by observing this multiple representation of this original vector, if you see this is very much redundant because the vector had only uh, n component and here you have n to the k observation at hand, what you want to do is again to retrieve the signal, but you are disturbed and the, 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 the problem is the presence of this noise. Now the traditional approach to that is a Bayesian approach in which you typically want to have access to the posterior of your um, uh, estimation um, that will be like a function of the prior, which gives like a, it contains a previous knowledge of where is the, well, what is the uh, region in which the, the signal, the original signal is contained. And then there is the likelihood, which contains instead the information about uh, the noise that is corrupting uh, our information, right? So that's a traditional approach and under certain circumstances can be also proven to be the optimal approach. But we will work in a simplified setting, which is the one of instead simply attempting to minimize, to minimize this, which, I mean, minimize the distance between this observation and the signal we want to estimate and this will be uh, obtained by maximizing the product of the two tensor. All right? So you see, if we want to minimize this distance, so if we want to obtain the x, that is, uh, well, the vector that would produ produce the rank one tensor that is the closest possible to the tensor that we observe, forgetting that there is a certain amount of noise, what we want to do is to maximize the product of their component. Okay, and if you uh, just insert the definition of the tensor, what you know about where this tensor comes from, you end up having, well, this expression, which is a function that in the year I put a minus to connect with the previous uh, definition of this p-spin model. So this is the function that in the end you want to minimize. And this function contains two terms, one term that is really similar to the PSPIN model in definition, and this coupling here are straight away connected with the uh, noise that is corrupting the signal. But then the part that is containing the signal will act as a field, a generalized field, because you notice there is a power field here, so it's not a, non, not a linear field, but it's a field that after all is pointing in the direction of uh, the signal that we want to retrieve. 
So you understand that while searching, the signal, you will tend going towards this to minimize this term, but then you will be uh, uh, distracted uh, uh, by the presence of the, of the noise that is contained in the other part. And pay attention, this R here is called the signal to noise ratio and will contain the original variance of the noise because I reshuffle the prefactor in this way. Is that clear? That's the inference, I think. Questions? So you're saying that given this part tensor model that we defined up in the, in the above, right, mm -hmm. we can arrive at this Hamiltonian, I think, right? Yes. So uh, what I'm saying like there's an equivalence between these is two that problems. this problem can be approached by this approach, this Bayesian approach, yes. but also in a simplified setting by this maximum likelihood yes. estimate. And the maximum likelihood estimate would correspond to minimize yes. this function. You can also show that if you want to work in the Bayesian approach, that would correspond to work with an analogous system, but at a finite temperature. Yeah. And the temperature will be defined again by this uh, um, this uh, noise, sure. because if you want to work in the optimal Bayesian setting, you have to specify the temperature appropriately. Okay. Yes. Okay, now one can also think of a slight generalization of the problem. Before we were having the p spin term and the field that were both controlled by the same k, that was the dimensionality of the original tensor. But in full generality, we can even deal with a, a more general problem, which the p spin part and the uh, power that controls the nonlinearity of the field are in general different. All right? I mean, this doesn't add complication to uh, the technical part and we give, can give us like a broader perspective of uh, even other inference problem that we might encounter. So this is what we were uh, looking at um, in, uh, in our first work about this problem. So I recap there is the signal to noise ratio and what we are doing is to finding the minimization of the minimizer of this Hamiltonian uh, on, on a certain uh, um, uh, space which is this multi-dimensional sphere and the space is the one that is defined by the, the prior itself in the Bayesian setting. One element that is very important to understand the result is what is, is this um, what is called the overlap of the um, variable that well the vector that we are using as an optimizer and the signal which means that when we have a solution with a non-zero overlap Okay, or with an overlap of order one in this definition, we are having a finite uh, amount of information about the original, uh, the original uh, uh, vector, which is what we are aiming at. So when we have this, and, and pay attention again, this overlap is appearing here. Okay, so it's, uh, the field is nothing but the overlap to the power k. So, uh, okay, and another comment on that, is that if I represent this problem of searching this uh, uh, the signal on the sphere in a two-dimensional surface, okay, again I'm oversimplifying the problem, but I want you to have in mind that in this rep representation, the equator of the surface is containing the majority of the space. Because what I'm doing is collapsing a much higher dimensional space, so this hypersphere uh, in, in much higher dimension into this two-dimensional representation and therefore the, the majority of space is contained in the space that is perpendicular to the signal and it's, well, it's very hard to develop a correlation with the signal itself, which is the hard like inference task that we are dealing with in this situation. Okay, now from the thermodynamic point of view, we can solve the problem, so we can uh, study the thermodynamics of this system at zero temperature, and that will immediately give us what are the features of the deepest minimum in this landscape, straight away. What is the ground state in physics, right? And well, this will tell us about the information theoretic transition, because when this uh, deepest minimum, so if we are able to find the deepest minimum, 
if the deepest minimum will be on the equator, well, there is no way we will be able to retrieve the, the signal, right? If instead this deepest minimum has a finite correlation with the signal, when well, an exhaustive um, study of all the space of configuration will allow us to find this deepest minimum and therefore to find information on the signal. So that's why finding the ground state, so solving the, the, well, the statistical properties from replis, replicas and everything will tell us about the information theoretic transition. But from, for obtaining information from an algorithmic point of view, we have to study the dynamics. And another approach would be the one of studying the whole structure of the landscape as it appears on this uh, sphere. Because again, the problem will be the one of starting from a very high energy, a random configuration, and again, characterized by high energy, but also characterized by zero value of the overlap. So we want to understand whether this rough structure will, be, will enable our algorithm to escape from the equator, escape from the majority of the space, and single out what is the correct direction uh, to search for the, for the signal. Yeah, this was explained here. Okay, at different latitudes, we might have different structure of this landscape, and we want to understand how this um, will turn out to be and connect the two things, connect the time, the dynamics to the structure. Questions? All right, so, well, I told you that we could do the thermodynamics, and it was just a slight generalization of the original uh, problem. We did the dynamics, and again, that was not such like a challenge, but the big challenge came when we wanted to, the, like, to generalize the, uh, this approach to study the structure of the landscape to this problem of studying the structure at different level of the energy and different level of the latitudes. And this is uh, just a slide to tell you that in that case, so what we did was to uh, put in this uh, cuts rise framework in which, well, the basic is the one that, so you want to evaluate the number of stationary points, and the cuts rise formula, of course, tells you that this will be, well, you will integrate over the entire space, and you count the point at which the gradient for the function is zero, and then you have this additional term that just comes from the property of the delta function that takes uh, this counting, and then you have to specify where, where, what is the level of the energy you are counting in, and what is the latitude, so the region of the landscape you want to count uh, this minimum. The problem that turns out to be uh, a major one in this computation is that when you do this counting, and specifically you want to uh, choose a specific level of the latitude, which is very important for our problem, uh, you have that this function, which is in general, well, this, this number, which is in general a random variable, um, fluctuates at the exponential level. And to evaluate its typical value, what you have to do is to take the average of the logarithm, okay? And then the, the variable itself will be the exponential of this, of this function. But the important thing is that you have to average the logarithm of the variable to take into account in a proper way the fluctuations. And this will introduce in the, what it is originally the cuts rise computation, replicas, okay? That will, will be needed to take, to, to perform this average. So what we did to uh, analyze this landscape exactly was to extend the cuts rise computation by including replicas. This introduced a number of technical com complications in the game, but uh, she was able to uh, go at the end of them, and uh, we finally have the whole structure of the landscape, okay? And what I'm doing here uh, in the next slide is to show the full structure of the landscape for different values of this uh, uh, field, for different values of the k, the exponent at the, in the field term. Okay, so that's, that's the setting. So here we have the signal-to-noise ratio, 
And here, this uh, solid black curve is representing the uh, latitude for the position of the ground state, the deepest minimum. Okay? The result that you have here for a linear signal is that, well, as soon as you have a non-zero signal to noise ratio, you will have a non-zero correlation of the ground state of the deepest minimum with the signal. So the information theoretic transition will be here. And then there is a little dot here, which is representing the fact, the fact that you can also obtain from this uh, thermodynamic approach. Uh, and it is the fact that after this dot, this ground state will be unique. So there will be one unique minimum that will be strongly correlated with the signal, and it's the minimum you want to find. Before that, there are a number of minima, okay, all equivalent and all correlated with the signal. But the structure is not, com not completely simple. Okay? But still, if you find any of them, you will have done your job, you will be happy, because this is, as contains this finite information. Okay. Very detailed explanation for the first, I will be quicker for the second. The only difference here is that you have a second order phase transition, okay? So, and, and therefore you have like a finite signal to noise ratio range in which uh, you are before the information theoretic transition and uh, a finite value at which the information theoretic transition will take place. And then in the uh, K larger or equal to three, you have the situation in which uh, you have a discontinuous uh, jump. This is the original problem in which k equal to th e, let's say k is always equal to p, which is the original sp spike tensor problem. And the peculiarity of the spike tensor is that the information theoretic transition takes place always after the minimum has become well. You have this trivialization in the topology. So you have one single minimum that um, is correlated with the signal and is the minimum that you want to find. Okay, that's just uh, a peculiarity for the spike tensor. And here I superimpose to this the full structure of the landscape. So this red band here is representing, well, the range of Q in which you have a finite range of energy in which you have a very large number of minima. Similar to what we have seen for the P-spin. In fact, the P-spin is always this initial part of the plot because it's when the signal to noise ratio is zero. So what you see again for the linear term, you will have that this band of minima will immediately shift to higher uh, level of the overlap or the latitude, which means that, well, if you start um, here, for example, you will end up uh, you, if you perform your dynamics, your gradient descent in your landscape, you will end up having a finite correlation, even if you're not able to find the ground state. In particular, one information that is telling you this here is given by the maximum value, so the, so the, the overlap that contains the maximum number of, of minima, so this higher level of minima in the original problem, is immediately correlated with the signal again. Now things change here and here and becomes worse and worse. So here the, the line at which you have the maximum number of minima stays always at the equator until you, has, you have this transition here in which this minima gets destroyed by the signal and then you can escape the equator. And then, in these other cases, the problem gets even harder because you have that this band of minima at the equator never disappears. Okay? So, this is the whole information on this structure. And, of course, as I was saying, starting from the beginning, we want to understand what does it mean at the level of the dynamics. And you already uh, start to see that, well, of course, before the information theoretic transition, if you start a dynamics from very high energy, from like completely uncorrelated configuration, you will never be able to get, to get anywhere because you don't know, I mean, even the ground state doesn't contain information on the, on the, on the signal. 
But here, after the information theoretic transition, or even uh, after when this minimum becomes a single minimum here, I mean, in any of these other situations, for any value of the signal to noise ratio, you will be able to retrieve anything about the signal because you will be stuck here. You will be stuck at the equator because of the presence of this large number of minima. Okay? And that's what we can say starting from this um, study of the landscape in this problem. Now, rapidly, I want to give you like a uh, perspective of what happens when we also study the dynamics. And again, either we use this information on the landscape to improve the dynamics, or in, the, uh, in an opposite way, we check the information on the landscape and the information on the dynamics, and we find that if these are different, we try to understand what's going on there. Okay, this is two things that we have been doing. So, in this dynamical setting, uh, I was working with these people that love to like focus on this slight generalization of this spike tensor problem, in which you not only have a tensor but you also have a matrix to look at. Okay, and this generalization has nice properties that are uh, that are uh, very good for uh, the context in which we went. We were studying this. Uh, uh, because the, the aim in this case was to uh, compare the performances of approximate message passing to this like landscape descent dynamics that will be the physical one, this driving descent dynamics that we are actually able to solve. And what we found by studying the, the two dynamics, uh, so approximate message passing and Langevin, or gradient descent, if you consider Langevin at zero temperature, is that, well, as a function of, here we have two uh, signal to noise ratio to take into account because you have two different uh, uh, noises. So our single plot with a single axis now becomes this phase diagram with two axes. We have one signal to noise ratio here, one signal to noise ratio here. And just to give you uh, the um, references, this is okay, the impossible region. So information theoretically, it's impossible to retrieve the information. However, you have that in this region here, you have a different behavior from the point of view of dynamics because, uh, sorry, here you have that both dynamics, Langevin and AMP, are not able to retrieve the signal. And here you have a different behavior because you have that Langevin dynamics is still finding hard to retrieve the signal, while AMP is finding it easy. Okay, and here comes a big difference between the two dynamics. So in general, we found that for this problem, AMP is performing better, and here, of course, it's easy for both of them. Now we want to understand why there is this difference and whether we would be able to help this Langevin uh, dynamics that is again based on landscape. Okay, you cannot escape from that. You are like minimizing, you are following your gradient during Langevin dynamics. So how can you help this minimization? How can you help this algorithm to perform better? So we put ourselves in a point here in this region of the landscape, and we saw the result. Of course, this is AMP that gets very soon to the very high value of the overlap, and this is Langevin. And, uh, well, but the problem is that Langevin, as AMP, starts from this uh, equator, but Langevin has this like entire set of minima. But you remember that, you remember that the situations were completely different if you consider k equal to 2 from k equal to 3, okay? So one thing we thought of would be, was to actually get rid of this part, which is really non-trivial. I mean, you give up some of the, well, a fraction of the information, hoping that this will give you like a better result. So what we did was really, okay, let's start our dynamics by just following this part, which at least on the equator is, is better, okay? And that's the result of a protocol in which we introduce gradually the second term is this, okay? So we start only with, the sec with this 
initial term that is able to let us, well, let us let the dynamics escape from the equator and then introducing the second term, well, here is fast, this introduction and here is lower and slower, we get that, uh, well, we get the result that we would get with only the first term, which is not good enough, but when we reconstruct the entire problem at the end, we end up getting the entire result from A and P. So again, thanks to the knowledge of the landscape, we were able to match performances from this gradient descent dynamics um, to the performances that are believed to be optimal, which are performances from A and P in the optimal setting. And then there is another conundrum we met in this uh, setting of this uh, uh, enlarged uh, spike tensor model. So we studied again, this is only Langevin, we studied dynamics and we found that the, inform the, the algorithmic transition is at the blue line here. But another thing we did was to study the landscape for this entire setting, so this Hamiltonian that is the sum of the two, and we found that actually the landscape, like the, the, the complicated structure of minima of the landscape, they disappear only here, right? So there is a region in between where there are still minima, but the landscape dynamics, the, the dynamics that should be based on landscapes, so this gradient descent dynamics, is performing good. And this is like a paradox, okay? And well, by really focusing in the details of the dynamics and the details of the landscape, we could understand what is it, I mean, what is the reason for that? And you can also understand that if you think to the original problem of the P-spin in which the dynamics is getting to this threshold state. So in some way, it doesn't really matter what, is, what are the states underneath doing. The important element, the important states for the behavior of the dynamics are the one at the first level. So what you can do is to evaluate, so this is what you observe at the level of the dynamics. The, the dynamics is plateauing on a certain level of the energy, but when you are like uh, here, you will see that it is still able to retrieve the, the signal why? Because these states that it is thoroughly exploring for a very long time will develop an instability. Mm. And this instability is towards the signal. So you will fly on top of the other remaining states and find the signal even if there is a rough landscape. So all this talk is about connection between landscape and dynamics, and, but this result is telling us that this connection is like a tricky one. So we have really to understand the details of the landscape, if, even to understand what is this uh, behavior of the dynamics for a dynamics that is really rooted on the landscape structure. And I have another on that, but maybe I will postpone that uh, at the end, because I wanted to tell you something about another approach, which is this time not on well, specific in inference problem, but refers to this much broader, well, but it's not broader, but it's like booming now, so uh, of big interest nowadays, which is the setting of machine learning. Now, um, how many of you know the basics of this? So I'll be rapid. So what is the, 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 the deal here? What we want to do, and I will be talking about supervised learning here. And well, what, um, what one wants to do is to find a function that is represented by this complicated structure that will be able to match images with certain number of categories. Now this function is not search among all the possible function is parameterized by a certain number of weights on this uh, network structure. And well, so instead of searching the optimal function, you will search the optimal weights. And how do you search it? Well, you evaluate what is the error that this function is making on a certain training set. 
And this, will, this error will be, of course, a function of the parameters. And what you want to do is to minimize this error function, which is called the loss function here, by changing the value of these parameters. And what is the dynamics that is typically used, because, well, it is the easiest dynamics that one could think of, is like a simple gradient design dynamics that would choose the new weights as the one that would obtain the best improvement on the error uh, with a certain, well, controlled by a certain learning rate and so on. Okay, so again, we are having a problem that is dealing with the minimization of a function <coughs> to obtain like an estimate of what is this uh, um, best choice for the weights that would allow the best uh, classification of all the images according to your uh, classes. Now, one thing that it, it is also quite widely used in the field is a generalization of gradient descent, which is called stochastic gradient descent. And it is like a little trick that enables people to do not evaluate the gradient of the entire uh, error, so the error on the entire training set, but you evaluate these uh, uh, new weights by just evaluating the, uh, the gradient using only an estimate of the function that you want to minimize, and this estimate is based on a subset of the image that you want to correctly classify. Now, I uh, am detailed on that because, well, it's generally believed that this is introducing an element of noise in your dynamics. And this element of noise will uh, turn out to be uh, interesting in the following. Now, we cannot do the exact analog of uh, with the uh, B spin model in this case, of course, because the micro uh, the, the, defi the microscopic definition of the problem is completely different. But what we were aiming at in, uh, in this last work I will uh, present is to like make a phenomenological analog of the training dynamics with the dynamics that is observed when you study the minimization, the decrease of the energy. Uh, after, uh, well, long and large event dynamics in the case of this pain. So I want to give you just two flashes on how this um, decreasing landscape look like from a phenomenological point of view. You have a descent in the energy as a function of time. This is a logarithmic time scale. And while well, this descent is a power law decrease, okay? In general, so this is slow dynamics, so of course it's a power law which is lower than an exponential decay, and in general this, uh, this low dynamics might also occur in a logarithmic uh, uh, decrease of the energy as a function of time, okay? This uh, slow dynamics that is called aging dynamics um, that was firstly described in this, uh, in this context of, of, of the P-spin. Now what does it mean this very slow decay of the energy? That, well, the dynamics going down is like temporarily trapped in these stationary points, and then the more it goes deep down in the landscape, the more it takes time to escape from a stationary point because they are getting flatter, more trapping. So it's getting more and more complicated to escape from 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 uh, uh, stationary points when when you are deep uh, later in your dynamics. Now this structure, this non-trivial structure of the dynamics is very well represented by looking at what is um, the mean square displacement of the variables uh, along the dynamics. So what you do is to observe how a, how a variable change position late at different times, okay? And you observe this at the beginning of the dynamics when the weighting is very small or at later times again. And so the curves depends on different T weightings. And what you observe is that when T weighting is large, the dynamics takes longer and longer time to decorrelate from their initial uh, position, initial uh, configuration. OK, so these are two features at the phenomenological level. Again, we are not talking about the microscopic decays. But these are these two features that we wanted to look for into in the result of training dynamics. So we tried a number of different networks associated to a number of different data sets, and we found something that is kind of broad, okay? There are some details that uh, 
different are different in the, in a, in a number of, of situations. But I will tell you what are the things that are generally realized in all these different settings. So what I'm showing you is for one of these the behavior, the decay of the loss function, this function that we are minimizing through stochastic gradient descent, um, as a function of time. Okay, just look at the at the green. Uh, function, the, the green curve here. So what you observe again, you have the logarithmic scale, you have this lower than, expo than exponential decay, in this case it's a logarithmic decay, and another thing that you observe is that at a certain point this decay gets to the, what it is, the bottom of the landscape actually. So you observe something that is, well, is low dynamics, but then at a certain point when you get to the bottom you expect that the system has reached equilibrium. Okay, so if you remember this uh, uh, mean square displacement that is a two-time correlation function, at this point should be time translation, well, you should experience time translation invariance, which means that should not depend on T-weighting anymore. Now let's see what happens if we, again, well, really look at this mean square displacement. In this case, it will be the mean square displacement of the weight of the neural network. We see that, well, there is a first regime in which not much happened, which is the blue part. In the red part, there is some sort of a like flattening of the curves, but nothing is really clear. And there is something that is really striking us, which is the last part, in which you have that um, there is not at all time translation invariance. At least this is what looks like by looking at this at this mean square displacement. And now what we have to do is to rethink the analogy between uh, training and uh, this Langevin dynamics in our model. And there is a weak point of this analogy, which is the fact that in this um, p spin temperature, so in the Langevin dynamics, the temperature is fixed, while for training is not fixed. For training, this temperature is this consequence of this stochastic gradient descent. So in some way, it is also dependent on the landscape itself. So what we did was to a posteriori give an estimation of the effective temperature that the stochastic gradient descent is feeling, is using, and we use this to rescale this mean square displacement because, because we wanted to get rid of this trivial uh, part. And this is what we got. Now it's separated. So we got the time translation invariant regime. So it was indeed this um, temperature that was really controlling this uh, puzzling uh, observation we were making before. And we observe a much neater uh, representation of the formation of, a, of the plateau in the mean square displacement that is the evidence of this aging dynamics, of this low dynamics that gets lower at later time. Okay, so we get the full analog uh, between the aging dynamics in P-spin and in uh, training of machine learning, but only in the descent regime. Okay, because here aging is stopped, there is this time translation invariant setting in, and actually the slope of this function tells you that you are in a diffusive regime here, which is telling you that in neural network, the landscape is rough, it's an a posteriori deduction that we are doing here, is rough to a certain extent, but then there is a flat bottom that you actually reach through learning, and then you just end up diffusing there. Now this result is not at all a trivial result, I mean the fact that you can reach this bottom. And indeed, this is just a key element for which machine learning has become so important and so used nowadays. Before, it was not the same. And yes, I will be quick on that. Uh, before, it was not the same. Uh, and why is, that, is it so? Well, before, I mean, the big revolution of machine learning came when, well, networks started to become deeper and deeper, okay? So this is to do with what is called in the field the over-parameterization of the network. So what we did was, okay, let's see what happens, was to check what happens 
when we look at the same thing, at the same behavior, but in an underparameterized network. Just to check whether this is the, uh, the reason, I mean, if, if it is really connected with the, with the good performances and everything. And this is the result for an underparameterized neural network. You have the behavior of the loss function, again, pay attention just to the green curve. You see that it decays, it's lower than exponential, it's a bit uh, more complicated, the curve. But one thing you, you can observe is that it doesn't get to the bottom, first observation. And then much more clear comes when you look at the mean square displacement here, there is no way of getting to the uh, this time translation invariant regime. Okay? So this means that here the rough landscape is all over the place. There is no flat region that is open because, because this is the regime of underparameterization. So in this context, this um, study of the um, dynamics by means of these tools that were uh, developed in the context of glass physics and that put it in connection dynamics and landscape told us, well, one evidence in which this overparameterization is very important in, in machine learning. And the evidence is that in this case, it really opens this flat manifold of, at the bottom of the landscape. And this flat manifold are reachable by this gradient descent dynamics. And well, with this, I just conclude. I uh, brought here just a, um, a list of the things that I wanted to show you uh, today um, by uh, looking at this problem of the connection between landscape and dynamics. Of course, dynamics we were dealing with along the entire talk was this uh, large event dynamics or gradient descent dynamics. Um, but, well, this connection we have, okay, on one side we have seen how the landscape could help these dynamics to be, become competitive at the level of uh, inference to optimal dynamics. Um, and on the other hand, we have seen also how um, it, this connection is no, not completely trivial. Okay? Uh, it goes a little bit beyond what it is generally expected. Uh, and this was when I was talking about uh, the general expectation that maybe, well, when you don't have minima, the dynamics get, uh, it's, it's easy, but when you have minima, it's always hard. Well, I was showing you that it is not necessarily the case. Uh, and that one has to enter very much into the details to understand uh, the, well, to get the information on the algorithmic transition. Uh, and then again, uh, landscape and dynamics uh, as, a, as a way to understand uh, the big, um, results obtained nowadays uh, for machine learning. And then there is a slide that I jumped. If you're interested, I can come back to that in the questions. Thank you for your attention.